Let me just welcome everybody. Again, you're here for the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your chief host, cat herder, and MC for the next hour. I'm very glad to see all of you here today. We have a terrific subject to cover and a fantastic guest we can't wait to get to. So let's get started. First, let me introduce uh, the forum, where it comes from, what it does. So the first thing you should know is that the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-oriented video conference that spins out of the Future Trends and Technology and Education Report. If you don't know FTTE, it's a monthly trends analysis uh, between 70 and 110 footnotes, which takes a look at new developments in technology and education and then tries to extrapolate them forward to better understand the future possibilities of higher education. We've been running for more than five years now, so we have a pretty good database of trends played out over time. If you haven't been there before, go to ftte.us to learn more. Now, a key thing about this work um, is that these trends, you can go back, Christopher, uh, the trends have been played out pretty regularly. So we have a good database of these that we can check back. So for example, we've organized them into education and context, context are good with demographics and economics, education and technology and technology. And all of these are pretty rich. And you can see that this makes for a nice map of changes in higher education. If you wrap them all together, we have what some call a higher education crisis. So you can take a look at this chart and print it and run with it. It's um, something you can use to organize conversations or to brainstorm with. But each of these trends is backed by dozens and dozens of examples of references from the real world. Now, when I mention the real world, please keep in mind that when we refer to the future of education, we have to think globally because higher education is a transnational enterprise. And this forum has shown that. You can see here from the uh, discussion chat, uh, we have people here from two continents. And from this map, you can see that we've had participants from just about every continent in the world, North and South America, Australia, all over Asia, the Middle East, and all over Europe. It's really important, I think, that if we're going to grasp what's happening to colleges, universities, as well as libraries and museums, that we need to think about these flows across countries of policy, of people, of practices, and uh, of course, money. Now, to talk more about this, we have to explain where it comes from and who supports it. And I want to thank some of those supporters right now. The first supporter is NYSERNET. This is a nonprofit in New York State, which helps get a whole bunch of colleges, universities, as well as some libraries and museums online at high speed. They've done great work, and we're very grateful for them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because you can see Shindig makes possible this wonderful technology. And if you haven't had a chance to use it or play with the different pieces of it, let me just walk you through it. Where I am and where this PowerPoint presentation is, for now, it'll go away. And where the guests are is called the stage. Everybody can see and hear us right now. And below us is what I think of as the audience swarm. If you look around, you can see folks like uh, David Raths and uh, Brenda and Kelly and Dave Rahm, as well as people who are here but don't have a video camera turned on, which is fine. Uh, you can interact with these people in all kinds of ways, which is part of the way the forum works. If you'd like to have a private video conference with any of those people, just double click on their icon. If they're up for talking with you, the two icons, yours and theirs, will snap together like Legos. And you'll have your own private audiovisual bubble. Meanwhile, you can still hear me and the guests around stage. Now, this is an interactive session. What I'm doing right now is showing you a couple of slides done within a minute. Let me just show you how we actually converse and have discussion. There are three major channels for this. So if you look down the very bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a white strip that has some icons on it. On the far left is an icon which tells you how many people are here. So right now there's 32. Next to that is a little chat box, kind of like a dialogue box for a cartoon. If you click that, you'll get a chat box that opens up. And that lets you chat to the nearest 18 or so people who have entered the Shindig environment with you. So already in the first room, you can see Tom, Valentin, Riyadh, Nancy, Jonathan, and myself, and Lee, and Kelly. This is a great spot if you want to toss ideas back and forth or ask questions. Now, next to that little button is a question mark. If you click that, you'll be able to type in a question or a comment that you'd like to ask. And if you do that, we'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it. And I'll read out loud so everybody can hear it, and the guest will be able to answer. So just click that and type it in, and we'll pop it up and read out loud when we're ready. Now, if your camera is working, your microphone is working, and you're in a good physical space where you can talk out loud, click on the raised hand icon. This is great, because then we can beam you up onto the stage, and you can talk with the guest, myself, and whoever else is up here. It's really easy to do. 
So three different ways for you to communicate with us. That's the whole idea here, is to have as much discussion as possible. And we're grateful to Shindig for letting us use this technology. We're also grateful to another source of support, and that is dozens of people on Patreon. If you haven't been there, patreon.com is a kind of Kickstarter-like, GoFundMe-like source where people crowdfund creative people. So I'm one of those creative people, and I'm creating documents and media about the future of education. So if you go there, you'll see a whole bunch of people who have been throwing money at me every month to make sure that we can keep doing all this work. Uh, if you haven't been there before, go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. And please, if you can, contribute. We appreciate every bit of it. Now, that's who supports us. That's how the technology works. That's where we came from. Let's cut to the present and the future with this week's guest. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I had the great honor of meeting uh, Jen Goldbeck. Uh, she keynoted a conference and was fantastic. She was dynamic. She was energetic in the field of cybersecurity. She was hilarious. She provoked an audience with a great deal of technical expertise. She was just a delight. Uh, obviously, cybersecurity is a major, major issue right now, both in higher education and beyond that. I can think of no better person to spend an hour discussing this than Professor Jen Goldbeck. Jen, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Glad hey, to be I'm here. Good. Glad to be here. Good. I'm glad you can hear and see us okay? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, welcome. I'm really, really glad you could come. Um, let me just, to begin with, let me ask, what do you do um, in terms of cybersecurity and computer science as a professor at the University of Maryland, right? Right, yeah. Um, so I tend to study the kind of human side of cybersecurity. So, um, you know, I have training in crypto algorithms and that kind of stuff, but I'm really much more interested in the part of it that deals with people. And, uh, you know, one thing that I have advocated for that you heard this summer, um, but that I've been kind of beating a drum for, if we think about that space is like passwords, right? And now I have NIST on my side that, uh, you know, we had all of these crazy rules for passwords, how often you have to change them, all the crazy character combinations you have, which is terrible for people. Like those are super hard for humans to remember, like all the way down to like the cognitive science and what like memory is capable of. And, uh, and yet those rules persisted for decades. NIST finally, like in the last month, changed the recommendations. It says you shouldn't have to change your password that often. You should be able to just use a few kind of longish words instead of this crazy combination of things. Um, but it takes people doing the kind of work that I am that are looking at the humans Inter interacting with the security systems to say, you know, it's all one system. And if it sucks for the people, it's going to be less secure. And so you really need to understand that intersection of human behavior and security to understand cybersecurity, you know, in a better, more comprehensive way. I'm saying that if it's, if the user experience is difficult or implausible or Kafkaesque, that's going to make the entire system less secure. Well, yeah, I mean, like at the University of Maryland where I am, and I I just last week yelled at our director of IT about this, we still have the old rules. And that I think is because of like a state auditor thing, right? I mean, these are these get so complicated, but we have to change our passwords every six months. And so I do what like everybody does. I have a number at the end and every six months that number just goes up by one, right? Um, so I'm on like number 11 now, uh, which actually makes the password less secure. It's much easier to guess and to break that way than if I were able to make something easy to remember. And if you mm -hmm. act like a cybersecurity system doesn't have any people, then you go, oh, well, these rules totally make sense. But if there are people, if it's really hard to use, we're going to do things to let us get on with our lives that are less secure. But that's not because we're bad. That's because the system is bad, because the system forgot that people were part of the system. And, and so I really kind of push to look at security systems like with the people in the system as opposed to the thing that's going to come in and break your system. Well, this is this is excellent. Um, let me take a step back just for, for one second. Um, yeah. This is something that you research and that you write about and teach about. Um, I was I was thinking that what we could begin with now for the first few minutes is we could talk about cybersecurity as a whole in the world. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, the Equa fiasco, for example. Um, oh my God. And then, <laughs> and then we can dive into the specifics of, of cybersecurity online. Uh, for for campuses and what it means for higher education. Well, that's sure. Work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want me to so, jump in, or do you have a specific place you want to start? I have one question, but I also have just one bit of advice for all participants. Please, um, 
you will have questions and comments, I guarantee. Um, so please don't be shy about bring them up again using either the chat box or raising your hand to be in a video or using the question mark to type in a question. Uh, we already see Tom Hames going wild in the chat box with a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> backgrounds and ideas. Uh, my first question to ask, uh, just Jen, from the top overall perspective, how how flawed is cybersecurity right now? Like really flawed. <laughs> um, it's you know it's kind of a mess, and you know despite the fact that we keep investing more into it, and right. you know it's the reason that it's so bad that it's so flawed is that you know so humans are creating it and humans are not perfect and these systems are all super complicated um but they're complicated in a way like they're held together with some string and some duct tape and you know there's a little scotch tape maybe in one part i mean the systems that you interact with uh, you know even big ones like you look at facebook or amazon like they don't even understand all the complexities of what's going on inside their system. They're just really complicated and they're designed to work and you know get out there, do the job, but they're not like beautifully engineered like an airplane is. It's much more a bunch of pieces that are stuck together. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's no easy way to change that. Like it's just really hard to build an evolving system that big, like we see in any kind of security, you know, any kind of system that has a security component. And so what that means is stuff is going to break and we find out that it breaks and then we come up with a way to fix it, but you need to get those fixes deployed. And so Equifax, which you brought up, like that was a known bug, a known security hole that they mm -hmm. went for months without patching. Um, now it's hard to patch. Like I'm not saying anybody, I mean, they should know better, right? At the same time, um, it's hard to keep up with all this. It really is many people's full-time jobs in a big company like that, um, which says something, I, I mean, I think that itself says something about cy cybersecurity writ large. Um, it takes a lot of people full-time to just keep fixing all the holes that we have. Um, so that's not gonna change. And so what we see is we're shifting more and more information into systems that can be compromised. Right, like my laptop on my desk, if it's not connected to the internet, is really hard to hack, right? Because how do you get to it? You need to physically get there. We keep putting more and more stuff in accessible places that are online, that are often in the cloud, um, that make them accessible to hackers. And that means we need to be more vigilant, but our security systems are still all kind of crazy. And uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's no one person or one organization's fault. It's just kind of the nature of software that you know it's gonna be buggy including in the security space but keeping up with that finding those vulnerabilities correcting them is a really hard job it must be um and a growing business to just keep this going yeah. um what do you uh do you think we're going to go past passwords and shift towards uh, either biometrics or to facial recognition or iris scanning or some combination of these yeah, it's a good question. I So I think in some places, yes. And we've certainly already seen it with phones, right? So like I have my iPhone. Um, it has, it does have a password on it, but I use the biometric thumbprint on it all the time. Um, you know, we don't want to shift to biometrics for everything because if somebody manages to compromise a system that has all the biometrics and publish right. those on the dark web, um, my thumbprint is no longer secure. So I only got nine others, right? And then I'm out of passwords. So we don't want biometrics for everything, but for like a device, you have to steal my phone in order right. to use my thumbprint, right? And so like, it's a much bigger thing than, um, you know, me using my thumbprint to like get into my, to an ATM, right? Where then it's stored in the cloud someplace. So I think in some applications, especially like device-based stuff, we do see the biometrics. Um, but, you know, I think we're starting to see other concerns that come along with the shift in how we use this technology. So if you think about our phones, for example, um, you know, Apple and the FBI had this big showdown a year ago about um, the FBI demanding that they open up this terrorist's phone. And Apple's like, no, uh, I'm 100% with Apple on this. Like, I understand the public safety risks. But if Apple creates that back door, every dictatorship is going to be using that backdoor to access 
you know, dissidents, anybody's devices. And you can certainly see U.S. law enforcement kind of running way out of control doing that. Um, yeah. We have so start, much information. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And we have so much information on the phones now. Right. It's not just, you know, who we've called. It's photos and locations. Everything we've done is on there. And so we have to think really carefully about that. And I'm a little, you know, Apple has been, I think, going the most the most in the right direction in terms of security until the new phones that were announced. What was it like last week? Um, because those are using facial recognition. So we just got Supreme Court decisions that said the cops cannot make you put your thumbprint on your phone to open it. But if it has facial recognition, the cop literally just has to hold it up to your face and it's going to unlock. Right. Um, and so uh, suddenly, um, you know, that protection that you had where you could say, no, I'm not unlocking it for you. They can just unlock it by holding it up to your face. Um, I yeah. would not buy a phone at this point that had facial recognition for unlocking because I, I mean, I don't do anything at all interesting to the cops, but uh, I'm very much a privacy fundamentalist and want that kind of control. And so if there's like such an easy hack for someone to get around it, um, I'm not going that way. So yeah, you know, I think in certain applications, biometrics, I, you know, I definitely think there's a place for facial recognition or iris scanning. Um, in some applications where, you know, you need to say a physical kind of access, those make a lot of sense. Online, mm. I don't know if we're going to get past the password anytime soon. Um, I think with the new NIST uh, regulations that we are going to finally, after decades, see a shift to something where you can have, you know, four words put together, all lowercase, really easy to remember. I think that those sorts of past phrases are going to finally start becoming more popular. They're more secure. They're easier to remember. It's better all around. Um, but mm. it's... Yeah, I think it's going to be a long way before we really replace the password system online. Wow. What an answer. Thank you. I mean, one of the things with the future is how the past persists. Um, yeah. I have, a, I have a boatload of questions more. Uh, I think Tom is going to join us on stage, or uh, Ray. Um, but please, uh, fire away your questions, uh, or get ready to jump up and join us. You can see we've got a fantastic guest with a lot of, a lot of experience thought about this. Hello, Tom. Good, uh, good afternoon, actually, um, that's right. or morning, if, if that's still the case for you. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you had any thoughts about going past security uh, in the sense of, look, it's become increasingly clear that once you digitize something, it's vulnerable to hacking. And there's always going to be a weak link in the chain somewhere. So perhaps the best thing to do with security is to significantly change our views of privacy and what needs to be protected versus what doesn't. I mean, I think there's always a crown jewels kind of thing relating to identity and maybe identity verification is a big part of this um, and um, relating to uh, financials perhaps. Of course, that's tied in with, with but everything else, just open it up, you know, because at what point, does it become impossible to protect everything? I always got frustrated when I was working for a public institution is that they tried to lock everything down. And to me, he who defends everything defends nothing, right? And uh, at a certain point, it got silly. I mean, we, we were subject to openness laws from the state. And so people were writing on the bottom of their emails, you can't, you know, do, do not read this email if it's not for you. And I'm like, it's a public record at this point. The second I press send, it's a public record because it's on the server. So how do you see that universe changing? Because I feel like right now we try to protect too much at the expense of what's protecting, what's important. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think up to a point that that's a reasonable argument. Um, we need to start thinking of certain kinds of data as from the beginning as things that are going to be public. Um, you know, I try to do that with a lot of my emails, especially at the university. Maryland is a state institution. And so, you know, we've seen this occasionally come along in, in some more conservative state legislators. They get upset at the academics. They try to take our email. And so I try to be kind of aware that that stuff could end up public at some point. Um, you know, I think kind of along with that, there's just a lot less data that we need to be saving. 
uh, we have so much data about so many things. And like, do we really need all of it, right? I mean, some of it we absolutely do, but I don't think we need as much as we have. Um, and there's, it's interesting, Mark Warner, the Senator from Virginia, has some interesting proposals that he's made in the Commerce Committee of, designed to discourage companies in that case from keeping as much data on users, like to basically value it and treat it as something that has a liability. Um, now, he's a Democrat, and so he hasn't had any success with that. But, you know, if we were to see control of Congress shift, I could see those rules coming forward. And, and I think they're a great idea that we just are collecting so much data that we don't need. Um, on the other hand, the kind of extreme version of your argument that I've heard made is like, look, uh, stuff can't be private anymore. And so you kind of need to get over it. And if everything is public, then, you know, any stigma that comes along with some personal thing leaking out, um, you know, that's going to go away because everybody's stuff is going to be out there. Uh, the parallel argument I hear is like, if everybody had HIV, then there wouldn't be a stigma with having HIV. And like, that's probably true, but I still don't want HIV, right? Even if there's not a stigma. And uh, like, right. I, I know that's not what you're saying, right? Um, yeah. But like, there's a- But there's that's a, a societal question then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a societal a question for yeah. privacy um, uh, from the stigma side, right? And, and you know, that that is a social question to deal with. But privacy, like the heart of privacy, the core idea of privacy is an issue of consent, right? It's a matter of me consenting to you having this information at this time and using it in the way that you say that you're going to. Um, and so, you know, when people, and, and I hear this from Silicon Valley types all the, all the time, so, you know, privacy is dead. You just need to get over it. Stop acting like you can have stuff that's private. If you replace private with consent, that suddenly becomes like a much less palatable statement. Like consent is dead. Stop trying to consent. Just allow people to do whatever they want. Um, I am... <laughs> I can barely not curse when I talk about that. Like it makes me so angry, this idea that like um, we have this technology and it's just far too hard for us to allow you to consent. So just give up the idea of having any consent. Like I think that's ridiculous. Um, and so of course, by that uh, again, logic, not that you wouldn't have credit rating as to say by that logic, you wouldn't have credit bu bureaus at all. I didn't give my consent, consent to Equifax to have my data. Yeah, I mean, I actually, I saw a great tweet that came out a few days after their breach that was, you know, someone had said, don't be mad at Equifax, like they're a victim too. And someone had responded like, yeah, if we can't feel compassion for a company that collected data about all of us without any of our consent, who can we feel compassion for, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> like, uh, so you're right. I mean, there's all kinds of non-consensual stuff going on out there. And for me, as someone... You know, who, reach, who researches this, personally, I am a privacy fundamentalist. I am an advocate for greater privacy rights and control. Um, yeah, I got a problem with that. It, and, and here's the thing. So we've done research in my lab about this issue. And it turns out, so you might say to me, hey, Jen, can this company keep a record of like you paying your bills on time? Would you be willing to let them do that if it's going to help you down the line get a mortgage or get a credit card? And I would say, yeah. I would be willing to allow that to happen. If they do it, if, so if I'm willing, if they do it without asking my consent, which is what happened, I'm much less comfortable than if they do exactly the same thing and ask me and I say yes. That ability to give consent, we've seen over and over, makes people more comfortable participating in systems. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are done without our consent. Do I think we're going to get big control over that? No, especially not in the US. Like Europe has a better legislative t trend on those issues, but we don't. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important as we're thinking about these systems that people do have a right to consent to how personal things about them are used and who has access to them. And we should be working hard to protect that right to consent. And uh, yeah, like it's really hard and there's going to be holes and there's going to be problems, but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Well, thank yeah, you, Tom. I agree with that. I, I'm, yeah, real, real, real quick, that also distinguish between anonymized data 
versus non-anonymized data. That's that's right. an important consideration as well because anonymized data can be an incredibly powerful tool if it's publicly available. So if you can see cancer distributions in a, in a particular area, you might recognize that there's an environmental hazard that's causing that. And that stuff is very important. And I don't, I, I'm concerned about losing that while we're trying to protect the identity of those cancer victims and balancing that out. So how you store the data and what kinds of data it is matters a lot too. And I'll sign off with that. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Tom. No, those are fantastic questions. Uh, we have some people in the chat box who have some questions. So um, uh, Chris or Ray, if you'd like to uh, either type a question or be, you know, join us on stage, that would be great. Um, Jen, uh, what a revolutionary image to think we have to rethink society in terms of consent and privacy. Um, you know, we just see so, we see consent increasingly being dismissed, especially by people, people who have power and will benefit by denying us the right to consent. And this is not just in cybersecurity, yes. I think this is kind of culturally yes. in general. And I think it's important, yes. you know, as a movement to push back against that. Well, I hope we can. Um, that's a whole politics to think about. Yeah. Um, Ray. Um, Ray, would you like to uh, join us? Or um, let's see. There's always this dramatic moment when someone's joining us on stage. Right? <laughs> right. I mean, a big drum roll or a dun dun dun. Ray, hello. Um, yeah, you know, I, the conversations went into like you know the philosophy of life. There's it's just real long questions. I uh, what where it started. It, it was the recent Apple thing that made me think of this question that you you uh, prompted me earlier. And so it was, you know, with the face ID, they said it was one in a million versus touch, which is one in 50,000. And, and I hadn't thought what Jen said earlier, you know, we have maybe 10 different fingers to choose from. But I, I in that whole uh, thing over the last week, I started reflecting on what about a voice password? Because then you have, you could do a word that you can change. And then you have this really more unique kind of multimodal data set of your voice. So I'm, I'm surprised. I, I haven't ever heard anything, but it, it just occurred to me. Um, what about voice passwords versus face ID uh, with the issues that Jen brought up and, and uh, what was brought up with the with the face ID in the last week? What it, yeah. Can you compare yeah. what voice ID versus face ID or touch or text password? Yeah, I mean, potentially voice IDs can be really secure. Um, you know, the the easy hack on a poor system is that you could have a recording of me saying something and play that back. Though a decent system can tell the difference between someone speaking live and something being played back in a recording. Um, so, there, you know, there's potential that that could be done with the right technology. I think the reason that we're not seeing it on devices like this is that um, you know, there's plenty of times you want to unlock your phone quietly, right? Um, so you could be in a meeting and you want to read a text message or, um, you know, whatever, something where you don't want to necessarily be speaking. Um, now, that doesn't mean it couldn't be used there, right? It could be one out of several options. Um, you know, I'd be willing potentially to enter the password. Um, but I think that's why we don't see it on more systems. Um, one kind of related thing, uh, this this ties in if we if we're gonna get a little academic for a second. Um, if we drill way down into cognition, um, there's a certain part of the brain that is used for processing speech. And it's the same part of the brain, the scratch memory that's used for really short-term memory, stuff that you're remembering for, you know, just a second. This is why, like if you're looking for an address you turn the radio down, right? And people like to joke about that being stupid because like you're looking for an address and who cares if the radio's on? And it's because you're holding that address in your scratch memory, which is also the part of your brain that is unconsciously processing speech. So if someone on the radio talks, it's gonna wipe that address out of your mind. It's also why like if you're working and someone comes in and they, they say, hey, how's it going? Like it completely screws up what you're doing because they've, interrupted that part of your brain. That's why our computers don't talk to us. That's why all the alerts, alerts are like beeps and boops instead of saying what they are. Because we can hear a sound and it's processed in a different part of the brain than the one that does speech. And so you wanna keep, I mean, this is my, like I think favorite cognitive science interacting with human computer interaction little tidbit. So you wanna think about that when you're thinking about where do you use a voice password? Um, if it's in, 
say like an entry, right? You're coming into an office. That's a super appropriate place to use it, you know, assuming it's quiet and all that, because you're not in the middle of any other tasks where like if I'm say logging into something, I don't even think about my password anymore, right? It's like muscle memory, what the password is. And so I can keep this, you know, what I'm working on and enter the password and use different parts of my memory. But if I have to talk, then I'm processing speech in my head and it wipes that out. So you'd want to find tasks that are not in the middle of some other important, like short-term memory cognitive process, that would be the right place to use a uh, voice password. So I think it's a great idea, but you know, like in response to the initial question, you just want to find the right application for where it's going to fit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank only you. other thing I'd say is I think we've all agreed to Equifax's data thing whenever we've signed probably who knows half a dozen things. Yeah. So we've all probably said, on the dotted line, we agree. We agree to it. Like when I, when he was, Tom was up there. He's like, I didn't agree to. It. I was like, Yeah. But then I was like, Oh, I'm sure it was down on the fifth page of somewhere. Fine print. <laughs> oh, it's a fine print. Thank Good you. Point. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Roxanne Rickson, um, who uh, might be able to join us. Uh, but she asks, Are there any medical models like HIPAA privacy that, in your opinion, have been going in the right privacy direction? That's a great question. Um, so we do see like a few domains that have pretty good privacy rules. Um, I mean, financial is one. Now, mm. data can get collected on you without your permission, but there are a lot of rules about what kind of stuff um, can just be dis disclosed. Um, HIPAA, I think, is another good one. Now, man, is it complicated to have mm. that deployed, right? And we, we see yes. it kind of showing up in all these ways. But, you know, I think the spirit of that is right. And the issues are more with you know, implementation, how do we get it exactly right? Uh, but in the university context, we also have FERPA. I, is that the right acronym mm -hmm. for um, protecting yes. student records? Um, yes. Which is fairly new. Like I remember as an undergrad, like having my name and student ID and like maybe part of my social security number posted just on some guy's website, like with my score in the class, you could just put that stuff up there. Um, now, I never really had a problem with it. My parents were always really demanding of having access to everything. So I felt like the most I'm going to be judged like they already got it anyway. Um, but, you know, I th this is sensitive material. Um, I love FERPA as a professor. So if somebody's parents call, I can outright refuse to talk to the parents, which is great. Um, and so we are starting to see these places where um, legislatively, we're recognizing like this is sensitive data that can really impact people for a long time. They have a right to control who has access to it. And so I think those laws are like little bright spots in, mm. uh, you know, what if we look to Europe, on the other hand, like they have a completely mm -hmm. different legislative model where our rule is once I share data with a third party, it's no longer my data. The third party can basically do whatever they want with it. Um, in Europe, I control my data, like I own it and I have a right to say who uses it. So I may say, you know, Facebook can have this and post it on their website, um, but you can't do a lot of stuff without my consent. And we've seen all of these uh, court rulings that say you have to take that data down. Um, my, my, probably not the most famous one, but my favorite is that in Germany, a bunch of people sued Google um, Street View, like the, where you can see the houses on Google Maps, because they said, it's my house. You don't have permission to post a picture of my house. And so Google mm -hmm. has a thing where if you're in Europe, you can put in your address and have it removed, and they blur it out like porn on TV, where it's all just like fuzzy. Um, it's because people say, I have a right, I should be able to consent to that being there. You did it without my consent. I want it taken down. In Europe, they have to do that. We could never do it in the US. Um, I think we could just you know, perfectly successfully have a European model here that there is a huge lobby against it. So I don't know that we'll get there. Um, but I think, you know, looking outside those little pockets that we have protected in the US, you can see a model that would work just fine. I don't think it gets in the way of innovation, which is the common co counter argument here. I think you can innovate just fine while respecting consent. Um, and so it's, you know, if you ever feel like, could we do something different looking at the European model and the rules that they have, um, you know, they create really strong incentives to respect privacy there and US companies keep getting in trouble because they try to get around it. Yes. Yes, and uh, a lot of European countries have really good recent historical reasons to be concerned about right. privacy. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of history, uh, we'll change things up right now a little bit. Uh, now we enter the session uh, called the Bingle session. And this is exactly like what happens when in a 
class or in a for or in an auditorium the speakers get off the stage and walk around and everyone divides into small groups to chat with each other so what i would like you to think about is based on on jen's comments and her answers to the question so far is to think about where you see security beginning to change at your institution if you're on campus if you're a library if you're a museum if you're at a company or a business office or a nonprofit office or a government office where do you see these trends happening? That is, are you, are you seeing an increased demand for more password changes and longer passwords? Are you seeing a push for biometrics? Is there a, is there a drive to get new cybersecurity programs? That kind of thing. So to do this, please grab one or two or three other people around you and double click on them. Now, if you don't feel like talking because your microphone doesn't work, say, or if you're in a public place, and no one can hear you, that's fine. Uh, just make sure that you click the lock. So at the bottom of the screen, there's a little, on the white strip, on the right edge is a lock. And then nobody can talk to you unless you absolutely let them. Uh, but if you do want to chat, uh, just double click on somebody and let's just take five or six minutes and see what we can learn. Then we'll get back and we'll compare notes. So let's do this and uh, we'll be back. All right, well, welcome back. This is how we close out the mingle session, where you guys have all been piled into twos or threes or fours. You know, there's Ray, Tom, and Roxanne right now hanging out. Um, so, Jen, what did you what did you catch from our conversation with uh, with, with Steve and with uh, Dave? What did you think? I mean, yeah, you know, I think the point that uh, if somebody's looking for a job, this is the thing to do. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, and this gets back to the questions that you started with at the top of the hour. Um, these systems are all broken. And what we're doing is putting more and more stuff in an accessible, penetratable space um, with kind of broken systems. And so cybersecurity is really just going to be more and more important as everything is shifting to the cloud, everything is shifting online, attacks are getting more sophisticated and coming from around the world. Um, it's gonna be a big growing industry for a long time. And so for students who are looking for things to do, there's so many aspects of this. They don't necessarily need to be system engineers, um, you know, the cryptography guy at their place. There's just such a huge range of stuff they can do from the really mathematical side, you know, go build algorithms, go work for the NSA, um, learn how to hack systems, you know, all the way to the human kind of social side um, where we have, you know, other faculty in my department. I'm a computer scientist. We have humanities people looking at you know, ethics, um, if you have a programmer, mm -hmm. what kind of permissions do they request? Like if they're building an app, what kind of security permissions do they request? Do they think about those ethics? Um, do they do it because it's easier to just ask for all the permissions and to ask for the ones that they need? Um, there's such a huge range of stuff to look at, to study, to be an expert on. Um, and we need a lot more people doing it. So I, I think that's interesting from a higher education perspective. Um, it's really a growing area that touches on a lot of spaces that we can point students towards. That's a that's a really great point. So on the one hand, there's obviously a major role for computer science, but on the other hand, we have a really interdisciplinary approach. Yeah. Yeah, and there's uh, you can see these programs. We have a information science program, but cybersecurity shows up in the business school, in IT, in engineering. Uh, our engineering school has a cybersecurity specialization, and so you can really get at it from a lot of perspectives. Oh, great. Great. Now, is this something which it's reasonable to expect an undergraduate degree, uh, you know, see a BA or a BS that could lead to a job, or is this something which really requires graduate study? Um, you know, I don't think you need graduate study. I think you can get an undergrad degree. You know, I don't know how many there are in cybersecurity particularly. There are some, but they're not super widespread. You usually get it in whatever discipline you're coming out of. Um, mm. But yeah, you mm. can definitely, you know, go right out of an undergrad program where you've you know, done a reasonable focus on that into a position. Um, certainly, it's really easy with a computer science background or an IT background, but I think even from some of the more interdisciplinary spaces, that's possible. Um, you know, to advance down the road, I think pretty much with every professional, you know, track, you might eventually want to get a master's degree, but you can certainly like right. get that bachelor's, go out and start doing it. Wow. Very, very useful advice, everybody. Um, not just if you're a student uh, or a parent, uh, but also for your institution. And I've been seeing more than a few campuses growing out cybersecurity programs. Mm -hmm. um, well, just, just remind everybody that um, 
you saw how easy it was for uh, Ray and Tom uh, to join us on stage, and you saw how quickly uh, Roxanne's question was beamed up on the screen. So uh, the questions that uh, you have, please bring them up, your questions and also your, uh, your uh, ideas and reflections. Um, Tom has one which is a really deep one. Um, why do you think the human element has been so underappreciated in the security field? So let me criticize my own people here for a minute. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to remind you all, I have three degrees in computer science, so I'm not like attacking from the outside, but from the inside. Right. Um, right. Look, you think about, let's just say the password rules, because they're a super accessible way to get at this topic, right? The password okay. rules come from a good place. I actually saw an interview with the guy that came up with the initial password rules, um, you know, as NIST changed their recommendations. And he's like, I'm really sorry for that because I've made everybody's life worse. Uh, but you know, they, it, they're not stupid, right? It's like, oh, combine all these different characters and types of things um, because it makes it more complicated, right? It's harder to break. Like combinatorically, it's more complex. Um, that comes from a good place. Right change your password often. So, you know, if somebody gets an old one, they're less likely to get a new one. Use different ones at different places. All those rules make sense if you don't think about people, right? Um, so it's not like, oh, those are idiotic rules. Like they absolutely make sense. But all of, all of the security that we've dealt with historically has basically been engineered as I am building a system and then people are gonna come in and use my system not I am building a system that includes people. And so when you talk to security people, and I've had them say this to me, they say people are the problem with security systems. Like all they do is break <laughs> our really good stuff. And uh, you know, it's like um, if you are very system like code, computer application centric, I guess that's true, right? If that exists by itself, then people just come in and mess it up. But you know, we wouldn't say that with anything else. Like I, I talk about, you know, you think about your mm -hmm. microwave, right? If it were as hard to use your microwave as it is to use your security system, none of us would ever use the microwave, right? Mm -hmm. The microwave was mm -hmm. designed like knowing that humans are going to come in and use it. So you have to make right. it easy for people to use it. And like pretty much all consumer technology is designed to make it easy for people to use it. And when it's not, we really notice, right? Um, You look at and it's gotten better, right? You look at how much easier remote controls are to use now than they were 20 years right. ago, because they've been engineered, right. right? To get better and easier. Um, the same thing with our phones. But security hasn't been like that. They, have, they haven't they have gone, oh, we want to make this easy for people to use. They've it, yeah. There's a very dictatorial attitude in certain aspects of cybersecurity where it's like, just do what I say. And if you don't do what I say, <laughs> then you're an idiot and you're the problem. And you know, what the problem really is, is that the people who designed those systems did not talk to people. And so they made systems that are really bad for people to use, but almost nobody's job is security, right? Your job is whatever your job is and security gets right. in the way of right. it. And so you wanna make security that's as easy to use, as unintrusive as possible, but they didn't care about that. They're like, you should just do what I say and security should be the most important thing. People mm. need to get their jobs done. So they're gonna go around the security if it gets in the way, not because they're stupid or bad, but because they have other stuff that's more important. And so I, th I think it has, it's been underappreciated because the people who are engineering those systems just didn't care, right? They just want people to do what they said instead of taking this more holistic approach like we've seen in basically every other area of technology. Yeah. Um, People have kind of been scapegoated unfairly. And so hopefully that's going to start changing. I certainly am advocating for that to change. Well, this is definitely a major current to, to follow. And I'm glad that you've all been here to uh, to uh, hear Jen push for that. I wonder, I mean, you remind me of a lot of things. I mean, one of Don Norman's uh, Design of Everyday mm -hmm. Things, for example, which is a great, great, great guy to study. Um, but uh, I, I wonder, too, if... If you want to approach this this way, what would say a campus? If you wanted to improve the security, cybersecurity for a campus, focusing on humans and what humans can do well and what lets humans do their job if they're a librarian, studying a faculty member or a student or whatever, what would that look like? How would if you could wave, if you could wave the magic wand at your campus or anybody else's campus, what would you do to make security more human oriented? 
Yeah. So, I mean, if we're really getting down to like the realities of doing this, um, some of some of the things that are in place are required by auditors. Right. So we still have the right. stupid password right. system at Maryland, um, not because they think it's a good idea, but because like the state auditors say they have to have it. There's nothing that we right. can do about right. that. I mean, we can have right. that battle. Right. But that's not a campus issue. Uh, but there are a yeah. lot of campus yeah. security systems that are like very much not fun to use that we do have <clears throat> control over. Um, and I think the issue there becomes doing again the same process we do with all kinds of other technology, which is user testing. Bring some people in, have them use it, watch people okay. using it in their natural okay. workflow and see how it interrupts them. And we have mm -hmm. literally decades of research on guidelines of how to make technology easier, how to figure out where the blocks are, mm -hmm. how to smooth mm -hmm. it out for people, how to be less intrusive, mm -hmm. how to make it faster or easier to remember. That really does go down in a lot of cases to that cognitive science like we were talking about before. And so if you get people who have training in human computer interaction and usability bring them into your process of designing or reevaluating your security systems and they're going to give you some of that perspective where even if it's not people's favorite thing to use it's still going to be easier for them you can make it better that way so you're describing a great process for the campus to go through a redesign process I, I think that's what you have to do. Um, and, and it can be little, right? So like we have one of these Sibboleth, like big authentication systems that's used all over. Sure. It has yeah. uh, like, there's like five different designs, right? Cause like it was deployed in different times. So it's like, sometimes it's got the red background oh, and sometimes right. it has the white right. one. Um, you could redesign that so it's consistent. You could redesign it so like if I just logged into the library, I am also logged in to like my grade entering system because it's the same login, right? You could keep track of that. Um, right. And you know, th that's not technically all that hard. It's not done right now, but it could be done. And so if you're paying attention to what people do, then you can redesign these little things that are actually gonna make a big difference because they're the small systems that people interact with over and over. Mm, mm. It makes a big difference, and it seems less extraordinary. It does. Uh, we've had a couple of comments that came in. I just want to share them. Um, uh, Dave Ron uh, is coming to us from Cleveland, and he pointed out that the demand for cybersecurity jobs should mean more academic programs. And we mentioned this. Nancy, out in Washington State, uh, shared with us uh, her institution's current list of programs and certificates. It's about five screens long from ethical hacking to foundations of information security, security tools, cybersecurity, information security and risk management, a master of science in cybersecurity engineering. I mean, it's this is definitely a, a growing, growing field. Um, so thank you both for, for sharing this. Uh, friends, we're close to the end of the hour and there are plenty of questions to ask. And I'm gonna give everybody one last opportunity to, uh, to fire away at, uh, at Jen. Um, if you have a, another last comment or question, please again, you know, raise your hand so you can join us up on stage. You saw how easy that is. Uh, or click the ask box if uh, you can't use your camera or mic right now, or just type it in the chat box uh, so we can bring it in. I have a zillion questions myself, so um, please you know, be careful. I'll, I'll just take over and run the whole thing. So if we have questions from Lee or from Jack, Rod, P. Munger, Janie, uh, Zach, or Dave, um, please join us. Uh, we have a question from Rod Weiss uh, who asks, uh, why does our state and federal government not appear to shut down Indian phone scams running for seven years now? The ones offering personal 9,000 grants mentioning ARA and Federal Reserve Bank like Obama.net. Oh, I, I still get those wrong. That's a good question. What's yeah, the there's so many of those. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the problem lies in the fact that they do operate outside the U.S. And, uh, ah, you know, we have yes. free Internet rules, which means you can access, you know, any website you want anywhere. They're not going to block you out from it. Um, you know, in a lot of countries, they'd be like, okay, like that's a fraudulent website. Our like right. national infrastructure is going to block it. We don't do that here. Um, so I think right. that's why it's so hard. They can't legally prosecute those people um, and all the infrastructures outside the U.S. The FBI certainly has active investigations going on a lot of those scams. Um, I, uh, you know, I work with them kind of informally on a bunch of different projects. So it's not that they don't care. I think it's just one of those things where jurisdictionally they don't have a lot of power. 
Wow, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And that's a fantastic question. Thank you. I hadn't, hadn't thought to ask that, but I definitely do experience it. Um, you know, I, I enjoy especially answering the phone or typing on my Mac and someone says, uh, your Windows computer is having a problem. Ah, no. <laughs> Um, Jen, you've you've touched on some enormous issues that really have the power to transform well the whole, the whole world, uh, and especially higher education. Uh, I love the way that you've given us so much insight into where educators can can go and what we can do. Um, but I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, so, unless you have any last words you'd like to say, thank you so much for coming and contributing. So thank much. you. It was my pleasure. I appreciate it. Great, Jen. Great. Thank you again. Now, just to, um, I'm not sure if this leaves us in a state of greater anxiety um, or a state of, uh, of positive production, so we can think about where your academic institution can go. Um, but think hard about this and where security can go, because we've been seeing this is just growing in power. Now, next week, we're going to have a different session where we're trying something brand new. The idea is we're going to start with a question and we're going to work through that question about the future of education technology through the entire session collaboratively. So the question in particular is, how will education use mobile computing over the next decade? So think about that over the next week. Think about how that can change your college, your high school, your library, your museum. And think about between now and 2027, what mobile computing will mean. Will students use it in new or different ways? Are we looking at new forms of storytelling? Will faculty start exploiting the power of tablets and phones? Or will we see the rise of still more devices which will have more impact? So we're gonna try this. We're gonna have a whole hour where we explore this question together. So think about that and come back next week. Now in the meantime, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Future Transform or about this technology or about our other work, we have plenty of links for you. You can go to ftde.us, which is where you can find the report. You can go to shindig.com, which is where you can find out more about this technology. And if you'd like, you can go on Twitter and find me at Brian Alexander, and you can find other people here as well. So in the meantime, thank you so much for being here this hour, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.